The following program is a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Next, on Outlook, Upheaval, the story of the New River Gorge, Part 2, an examination of the history of the New River Gorge National River and the role of the National Park Service in preserving the New River Gorge's past while shaping its future. The story of the New River Gorge is one of ongoing upheaval, both natural and man-made. Geologists suggest that the gorge owes its existence to the swift, eroding waters of the New River, coupled with the rise and fall of young and ancient rocks over hundreds of millions of years. Its unique nature makes the gorge ideal for the migration of rare species of plants and wildlife. With the advent of rail transportation, the region's abundant natural resources fueled the nation's industrial revolution. Today, more than 70,000 acres along the New River Gorge are preserved and protected by the National Park Service. That's about 56 miles of the historic scenic waterway between Hinton and Golly Bridge. Ranger Billy Strasser says the National Park Service also works to preserve the history here stories which help Americans understand their common heritage and remember who they are as a people and a nation. And so when you come to New River Gorge, you'll be hearing the stories of the Native Americans that lived here many centuries ago, the early settlers that came to this region, the coal miners that worked to get the coal out of this area, and up through the present day of people coming out to enjoy this place. The main line is below this, in the summer of 2009, the National Park Service hosted a guided tour of the remains of Nuttleburg along the New River in Fayette County. Suzanne Fisher, who grew up just four miles away in the community of Winona, says she's pleased with the National Park Service's efforts to preserve this once thriving cold community. While she's rafted the rapids just below, Fisher says she never actually visited the place where three generations of her family mined coal. My mind is just going every which direction, and I can see them walking around here. My great-grandfather, my grandfather, and daddy working here. And when you saw the tipple and all of that, you can just see that that's where they were. That's where they were. You can picture them. We had trees literally growing up through the middle of that. And Richard Seegers the, is a uh, historical the architect the with the National Park Service. He says John Nuttall, a Pennsylvania entrepreneur born in England, was among the first to capitalize upon the region's coal mining potential. And he bought up over 200 acres of land in this area for a dollar an acre. He opened up two coal mines. Everything was here and he was ready to go when the CNO came through in 1873. He was the second coal operator to ship coal from the uh, New River coal fields. The 26 coal companies in the New River Gorge employed newly arrived immigrants, white workers from neighboring states, and blacks migrating from the rural southeast. Carter Godwin Woodson, now considered the father of Black History Month, spent six years mining and loading coal in Nuttleburg and nearby Kaymore earning just pennies a ton, he saved enough to attend Douglas High School over a hundred miles away in Cabell County. Daia Salam, an oral historian with the National Park Service, says coal operators were known to deceive prospective miners from the South in order to secure dependable black workers for less money than that paid to white workers. One of the things that the companies would do to entice African Americans to come is to pay their way from the South. But then when they get here, they'll take it out of their pay. Newly arrived workers and their families found communities within communities with their own churches, schools, and shops. If you was a foreigner, or if you was African American, you had to go to your own separate camps. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. 
Singer and actress Doris Fields grew up in a coal camp near the northern end of the New River Gorge. She says that despite the harsh realities of segregation and coal mining, thousands of African Americans poured into the region to carve out a better life for themselves. At an early age, Fields' father left Alabama with his family and soon found work carrying a canary whose death would signal the presence of poisonous methane. When he went in the mines, when he was uh, 11 years old, 10 years old, he stayed in the mines until he went in the military. And when he came back, he went right back in the mines. And he always had a job. And through the Depression, he always had a job. Myron Wood lives atop the mountain overlooking Nuttleburg, where he once mined coal. He says that once he and the other workers entered the mine, color and race meant little. You're so busy, I guess. Trying to load coal, you didn't have time to get, to get mad at anybody. <laughs> it was a pretty rough life. A pretty rough life. In the first decade of the 20th century, communities along the New River Gorge lost 357 men due to roof falls, fires, electrocutions, and other mining accidents. Daia Salam says miners joked about eating the best tasting, least healthy part of their lunches first. So if you had a piece of candy or if you had a, a dessert, you would eat that first in the coal mines because you didn't know if the roof was going to fall in. In 1900, the flames of miners' lamps ignited methane gas, causing a massive explosion in the Red Ash Mine near Thurmond. Forty-six men perished. In 1915, 114 miners and a grocery delivery man walking past the entrance, died in an explosion at the Leyland Mine near Quinnemont. They would have memorials for people that died. But within a few days after that, the people, the family members that were left, the wife and the little children, they would often be just tossed out of their house, the company house, because the man didn't work in the mine anymore. There was no safety net. You didn't have welfare. You didn't have unemployment compensation. Myron Wood says the life of a coal miner tended to drive men either to church or the local saloon. You had some people went to church and, you know, just lived everyday life. But then you had a lot of uh, younger like men, and they would work in the mines all week, but then they would go out and get a little drinking on Saturday night. And sometimes they would wind up in jail, but they got out and they would back down to the mines on Monday morning. For several decades, beginning in the 1870s, the boom town of Thurmond and neighboring Dunn Glen offered visitors both business and pleasure. Thurmond served as a filming location for director John Sayles' 1987 motion picture, Mate One, dramatizing efforts to unionize southern West Virginia coal miners in the 1920s. While Thurmond may seem somewhat isolated today, many once considered the railroad town the heart of the New River Gorge. In 1910, 76,000 people passed through the depot. With a town that never had a population of above 500, that was pretty remarkable. They would say that the town here on a Saturday night looked like Las Vegas. There was so much going on. As hotels and boarding houses overflowed, Thurmond firmly established its reputation as the Dodge City of the East. While gambling and the sale of liquor were prohibited within the city limits, both could be found just across the New River from downtown Thurmond. There was a hotel called the Dun Glen, which was actually a fairly nice, elegant hotel for its time. But also on that side of the river, there were some other small little bars, saloon, kind of seedier areas of the town, if you will. In addition to liquor, prostitution, and gambling, the 100-room Dun Glen featured several shops, a bank, and even a mortuary. The lavish hotel also boasted a 14-year poker game that yielded $6,000 of monthly credit at a local mercantile store and recognition in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Now, it wasn't the same people all the time, but for 14 years, this game never completely folded or quit. It was just ongoing. As trains carried away coal from the region's mines, 
the town of Thurmond benefited more than any other along the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. Thurmond, claiming to handle the most freight between Richmond, Virginia and Cincinnati, Ohio, boasted the wealthiest banks in West Virginia. Banking was a huge part of business in Thurmond in Thurmond's heyday. During World War I, the bankers of Fayette County would meet here in Thurmond, and in fact, between 1917 and 1919, did manage to sell $4 million worth of war bonds. Adjusted for inflation to today's dollars, that's over $34 million worth of war bonds sold here in the New River Gorge to support the effort in World War I, and that's a huge amount of money. As passenger trains ushered doughboys and businessmen in and out of the New River Gorge, a procession of Model Ts navigated the rough-hewn terrain of West Virginia's hills, transporting a celebrated trio of campers, tire and rubber company founder Harvey Firestone, inventor Thomas Edison, and automobile manufacturer Henry Ford. To increase efficiency and profit, Henry Ford and Sons acquired Nuttleberg Coal and Coke Company in 1920. Employing his theory of vertical integration, the senior Ford purchased the coal operation in an attempt to control the entire production cycle. Everything from product design and testing, and procuring and shipping raw materials, to finally selling each vehicle. Henry Ford ran into opposition when the Interstate Commerce Commission prevented his cutting rates to increase business through his Detroit, Toledo, and Ironton Railroad. Unfortunately, the problem that he ran into was that he couldn't control the railroads. Therefore, he sold uh, Nuttleberg uh, after owning it less than 10 years. Sold to the Maryland New River Coal Company, production peaked at Nuttleberg in 1929. The operation closed in 1958. As coal mining along the New River Gorge ebbed and businesses closed their doors in the one-time boom town of Thurmond, some 45 miles south, the New River Gorge witnessed the birth of a new community. Today, piers once supporting a rail line run by the Glade Creek Coal and Timber Company can be seen from the top of the plateau at Grandview. Here we're looking at a, what I'd call a picture of downtown Hamlet. Uh, we're standing just off the bottom of the picture here. and the side Ranger Mark Bollinger right says that, in addition to coal camps, the coming of the CNO Railroad gave rise to Hamlet and other timber towns along the New River. The first company to purchase land here was the Wilderness Lumber Company, and they built a rail line from the top of the plateau down along Glade Creek to haul timber out of this region. And then by the 1930s, it was a full-fledged town of probably a couple dozen home sites. Uh, they had a company store. Uh, they had a boarding house, which just was a room rental for workers that come in for the week and they'd board there, work at the mill. Nine branch lines along the New River Gorge serviced 78 miles of rugged mountain terrain. Historian Tim McKinney believes lumbermen gave little thought to the future as they depleted West Virginia's old growth forests. You saw bandsaw mills opening in the area. Uh, one of the largest in the world at the time was located in uh, nearby Raynell, just across the line in Greenbrier County. They had a bandsaw mill there that could actually cut 17 acres of timber in an 11 hour shift. And so between 1873 and 1925, when the lumbermen were in here, they cut 80% of the valuable forest out of the New River Gorge in 50 years time. It was just almost a gold rush, but it was wood. This gorge was pretty much cleared of timber, just denuded. And that was the first cutting. You know, they've been back and cut it since then again. So the timber you see through here is third growth timber, pretty much. Most of what you see when you look around the mountains of the New River Gorge would be trees that have grown in the last 50 years. And even among those, you're not going to find much hardwood. And who knows if the gorge will ever regain much of the native hardwoods that used to thrive here. Now the steam was on the left side, John Henry's on the right. Oh, they hammered all day and they hammered all night. Steam rail on the left, John on the right. Oh, oh. Steam rail on the left, John on the right. In the early 1930s, as the Great Depression tightened its grip on the nation's economy, a workforce of some 4,000 amassed to construct a Union Carbide facility at Hawksnest, West Virginia, to produce hydroelectric power. 
And so many people, when they think about Hawk's Nest, they think about the Big Bend Tunnel, they think about the legend of John Henry and Man Against Machine. And indeed, those scenes did play out here in Fayette County just as they did at the Big Bend Tunnel. To circumnavigate five miles of curves along the New River, as many as 600 men during an average 11-hour shift worked to construct a water diversion tunnel over 40 feet in diameter. Drilling through three miles of high-grade, silica-rich sandstone, workers, mostly African Americans, labored in confined spaces with neither dust control nor ventilation. These were the darkest days of the Depression, and people needed work. So when the laborers saw a mine inspector or a foreman come through wearing a dust mask, I don't think they gave it much thought. This is the story of silicosis, a disease of the lungs caused by breathing fine particles of dust containing silica. As illustrated by the U.S. More Department of Labor in the 1938 silica. film, Smaller Stop the Silicosis, drilling produced lungs. dust comparable to fine finely ground particles of glass. Since construction of the tunnel did not fall under the classification of a mining operation, no underground safety regulations were in place. The early onset of silicosis affects the breathing naturally, and people find it difficult to even move short distances without wheezing for breath. They lose their stamina, they lose their ability to get around, their quality of life is greatly reduced, and it goes into first, second, and third stage silicosis. By the time you're in third stage silicosis, it's about all you can do to get up and walk from, say, your kitchen table to your chair. Go to sleep, you weary hobo. Let the town drift slowly by. And you hear the steel rail humming. That's a whole world's lullaby. In 1931, a Universal Newsreel crew filmed in and around Hawk's Nest, known to workers and their families as the Village of Death. My name is Delbert Surgeon. I'm 23 years old. I worked in uh, Hawk's Nest Tunnel for four months, and each and every day that I worked in that tunnel, I had to carry off from 10 to 14 men, was overcome by the dust. And I know I have silicosis and uh, am not able to afford medical treatment. My husband, Cecil Jones, died of working in the Hawks Nest Tunnel, contracted silicosis, and died. I was paid $1,000 for his death, and after the death, Dr. Bill was paid out of it. I was left destitute with two little children to take care of and no means whatever to support them. Only $2 a week that I get from a federal government. And I hope that Congress will make an investigation that I might have something to live on. And John Henry said to his captain, got an awful roaring in my head. In 1935, the U.S. Congress launched an investigation into what came to be known as the Hawk's Nest Disaster and one of the nation's worst industrial catastrophes. Congressional investigators in 1936 determined 476 deaths related to silicosis from construction of the Hawk's Nest Tunnel. Years after that, it was determined the number was likely more in excess of 1,000 people who eventually succumbed to silicosis relating to their work in the tunnel. The Hawk's Nest Tunnel remains in operation today. The New River Gorge area played a vital role in the industrialization of America, and that's really important. But it came at a terrible cost, the exploitation of people and of resources. And that's symbolized by the John Henry story, the coal miner's story, the Hawk's Nest disaster story. And one of the important roles of national parks is to preserve our history and serve as a reminder to us as Americans of where we've been and maybe where we want to go. And sometimes we do remember and learn from history. In the mid-1970s, a new resource threat came to this area, and that was the construction of two dams on the New River, which would have displaced hundreds of businesses farms, and over 2,700 homes of people who'd lived here for generations. And this time they remembered and they rose up on a common cause and they said no. The people prevailed and in 1976, Congress established some 26 miles of the historic waterway as a federal scenic river. Just seeing nature move by is really quite extraordinary compared to what we normally see in our lives. 
part of you is just just relaxing and, and the world's going away and the other part is saying, hey, what's up there around that corner, you know? What is that little wisp of smoke that's coming up there? Is that fog or is that smoke? What's going on? And the current catches the bow of the canoe and just tugs it around and you're gone and that's, that's magic. To further protect the historic waterway, the United States Congress in 1978 designated the new as a national river to be overseen by the National Park Service. Through a multitude of programs, monitoring water quality, for instance, while protecting bats and other endangered species. Wildlife biologist Mark Graham says New River Gorge National River's MAPS program, monitoring avian productivity and survivorship, is one of many to help restore the ecosystem here. We tend to collect data just in our own little niche, and birds um, travel across the continent. And so by pulling in the, the data from these MAP stations from all over the continent, Instead of just what's the trend for American goldfinches at New River Gorge, you get a, a feel for what's the trend for American goldfinches across the entire continent to look for trends that go up or down and then look for causes, for example, habitat or man-made pressures that could be affecting them, pesticides, whatever. Ranger Mark Bollinger says education is a key component to protecting New River Gorge National River. We try our best to educate outside the park so that people living in the communities surrounding us understand that what they do on their land, what they do in their little community, will affect their national park here at the New River Gorge. In 1998, the federal government further designated the new and American Heritage River. Ranger David Berry says educating young people is vital to protecting such national treasures as the New River Gorge. That's a major focus right now. We try to get school kids out here to the parks and we try to visit schools and really get people thinking that we are a part of this natural ecosystem all around us and we need to take care of these places because we depend on them. To introduce area youth ages 14 through 17 to what New River Gorge National River offers and the importance of preserving its ecosystem, the National Park Service established a Rangers in Training Awesome Adventures program in 2009. Participants experienced the great outdoors firsthand through nature walks, instruction on the fine points of archery, and the basics of fishing, rock climbing, water safety, and whitewater rafting. Since the startup of Wild Water Unlimited in 1969, rafting companies have proven quite successful along the new considered one of the finest whitewater rivers in the eastern United States. Erin St. John. When the New River Gorge National River was created, it was seen as a way to preserve amazing scenic values, the wildlife habitat, the river, water quality, and as a free-flowing river, but also to showcase the whitewater industry to develop and, and grow, and they have over the past 30 years. And I think part of what we're seeing now is more people are coming to the area and are attracted to this amazing resource. You're starting to see different types of development. Many fear the kind of large-scale development proposed in 2005 by land resource companies to develop Roaring River, an upscale residential community with 2,000 lots on nearly 4,300 acres along the New River Gorge. LRC, citing the impact of the nation's economic downturn upon the real estate market, filed for federal bankruptcy protection in 2008. Recognizing that the New River Gorge is part of this larger system and it's, it's not just an isolated island and it can't be saved by the Park Service alone, we really have to work with the whole spectrum of stakeholders to figure out what we value about the place and then work to protect it. It's a beautiful place with really very uh, thick hardwood forest. Uh, Gary Driggs believes commercial and residential development is possible without destroying the region's ecosystem. As manager of New River Ledges Associates, Driggs expects his New River Gorge Preserve, a gated housing development, to complement rather than detract from the gorge. The forest here on top is an integral part of the gorge. And to preserve the plant life and the animal life, you need a 
unified area of forest. So the idea of these houses is to have them fit in with the forest and have a minimal impact. Journalist Noah Adams. You know, you can't have another new river. It's not going to happen, so it's the only one you got. There have been abuses, and I think people now know that, that, that we've ruined most of the rivers we have in this country, and here's one that's now protected as a, as a scenic waterway, historical waterway. The communities along the river are turning to it rather than away from it, embracing it. I've got a lot of hope for what's going to happen to the river, which is, to say, not much. Right on that new river train. The same old train that brought me here's gonna carry me back again. Run on that new river train. Run on that new river train. Why the same old train that brought me here's gonna carry me back again. This program has been a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for Outlook is provided by the following. The National Science Foundation's West Virginia Experimental Program to Stimulate Competitive Research. Investing in West Virginia's future by building infrastructure for scientific research. On the web at wvresearch.org.